This is what I would call a different kind of lesson. It's this is about studying the Bible more than it is about the content of the Bible. I'll tell you that up front. But I think that it's useful, and I think that it's encouraging. So that's why I wanted to do it. We've um, had our share of bad things and and uh, setbacks for the members here, and and uh, a little word of encouragement. You know, something interesting, or maybe even something distracting, but hopefully something that you find useful that I uh, wanted to bring to you that um, you can take home and, and, and do or not even take, you can start doing it, you know, uh, during the lesson or during the class or whatever, but I wanted to provide for you this, the secret, I guess, to unlock some things here that are available to you for your own personal Bible study that uh, you may not realize are available to you and Uh, are of great value. Maybe you know that it's there, but you don't know what to do with it, or maybe, you know, don't understand what the value of it is anyway. Why bother with it? So I'd like to tell you what that is so that you can do it and start doing it and start seeing your understanding grow and your depth in the scriptures grow. Because we're supposed to be about growth anyway. That's we come together for the better and build each other up, and that's the idea. So In this particular case, when we're talking about studying the Bible, um, we're talking about benefiting from the original languages of the Bible. And yes, a little spoiler alert, but the Bible was not written in English. Uh, The Apostle Paul did not use the King James Version, um, just in case there was some confusion about that. Uh, He did not. In fact, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and the New Testament was written in Greek. There are other versions, uh, you know, from ancient times. There are other versions, other translations and ports of the scriptures and other languages, but the originals are these. Um, With a very small exception, some of the letters from Babylonian captivity are actually in Aramaic, not Hebrew. But, yeah, short portions, and that's not worth troubling yourself with because it doesn't matter what language we're talking about for the purposes of this little trick that we're going to be talking about. Uh, the, The reason for talking about the languages, though, is because it does matter getting the accuracy, if you will, and the help that comes from the original languages is of benefit to us. It helps us to understand some things, to unlock some things, to find some correlations that we may not otherwise have found. Um, First thing that I want to talk about is a fear that a lot of people have when it comes to original languages, Greek and Hebrew, for example, or any of this kind of study. People say, well, you know, don't I already have the truth in my Bible? Are you telling me that I I can't know the truth without Hebrew or Greek? I, I don't have the truth in the King James Bible. No, I'm not saying that. You do have the truth. You have what you need to be saved. The reason for this study is because you may want more than just what you need to be saved. (laughs) You may want to know more and understand better and see more things in it. But the fact is that sometimes it's just plain helpful. Um, There are times when you don't know without some help. I remember well, and I'm looking at 1 Peter 3, verse 6. I remember very well. Uh, being a new Christian who, you know, has started studying Greek already, I was sitting in the Bible class um, up at Woodmont. It must have been summer um, because I wasn't allowed to attend during high school. But uh, And I didn't know Greek during high school either, so it must have been a summer. But um, sometime when I was a new Christian back there, but had already started to study the Greek language. I was sitting in the Bible class by Tom Roberts, who was then 
um, not that he is it now, but even this 30 years ago, whatever this was, uh, it's probably about 30 years ago, he was sitting there, uh, or he was there with uh, many years of experience in teaching and preaching the gospel. He was very experienced, very knowledgeable, um, an excellent teacher. And uh, we were in 1 Peter 3, and we got to verse 6, where it says in the King James, Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are? And the question came from the members, well, Whose daughters is it? Are we talking about your Abraham's daughters whom Sarah obeyed? Because we're children of Abraham, we're the seed of Abraham, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, on the one hand. Or is this Sarah's daughters? As in, you're following the example of a godly woman who came before and set an appropriate example. Now, the truth is that Tom got it exactly right. And he did so by means of bringing forward several parallel passages in Scripture, bringing forward other places where there are examples of, of, or there are women who are called examples, other places where Sarah is referred to. He was able to show by the context of the other Scriptures and his own personal, you know, great strength in the Spirit. Uh, his own experience and years of study to affirm confidently that it's Sarah, Sarah's daughters. That's what we're talking about. Clearly, we're saying in the context of 1 Peter 3 that you are like Sarah, be like Sarah. Um, and he is exactly right. That is true. And he knew that because of his experience and because of his ability to bring and put together lots of other similar kinds of parallels and teachings. Um, and if you have his years of experience and study, well, okay, then maybe 1 Peter 3, 6 doesn't trouble you. <laughs> and if you have his, uh, or, or even if you don't, but you have access to him, you know, there's a Tom Roberts preaching uh, where you are, or you're married to a Tom Roberts, or whatever it is, well, okay, maybe you don't need it. You don't need to go any further. You can just ask Tom. <laughs> but I think you maybe want to have it yourself. And the reason I say this is, you know, in this particular case, I sat there in the class with less than five years of experience knowing instantly from the Greek that this is Sarah's daughters. It's in the feminine. I didn't have the years of experience. I didn't have the wisdom. I didn't have the knowledge. I'm not saying those are bad things. I'm just saying that there are times like this where it is a shortcut to something that might otherwise be difficult to figure out. Uh, now, d d is this going to keep you out of heaven, not knowing whether it's Sarah's daughters or Abraham's daughters? No, no. It's just an example of where having the original can be quite helpful and can be a shortcut to lots of years of experience is what we're getting at. Some things that take people a long time to reach and come to an understanding of can be yours, not everything, but some things can be yours just by unlocking information from the original. Um, do you have the truth in the Bible you've got? Yes, you do, probably, unless you're reading the NIV. But um, you do have the truth in the Bible for the most part. Um, Yes, but even the apostles didn't always stick to their translations. And what I mean by this is they, they had a translation of the Old Testament into Greek, which is called the Septuagint. Um, and they clearly had a, you know, they clearly had it, they had copies of it because they quote from it verbatim at length. I believe, there's something like 300 quotations from the Septuagint in the New Testament, um, and there are something like 30 of them where it's not verbatim, where they changed the words 
or they changed a specific word or a phrase or they skipped or they chose not to use the Septuagint translation but provided their own translation of the Hebrew into Greek. The apostles did this. So some 10% of the time they chose not to stick to the translation. They thought there was something better available than the Septuagint. An example of this is Hebrews 2 and verse 12, which is in your New Testament, but it's in Greek, and it says, it's quoting from Psalm 22. It says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. Tell of your name to my brothers. That's what the New Testament Greek says. And Psalm 22, translated by the Jewish Publication Society out of the Hebrew, says, I will proclaim your fame to my brothers, which is very much the same thing. Tell of your name, proclaim your fame. That's the same thing. That's a good translation. However, the Septuagint, um, which is always abbreviated LXX, we can talk about that later, but the Septuagint doesn't say, I will tell, tell of your fame or tell of your name. It says, I will set out in detail your name. This is not the same thing. There's two different kinds of tell. One of them is tell them all about it, give them all the details and the nitty-gritty. The other is tell the story, get it out there. And the Hebrew is tell the story, get it out there. The apostles chose to go with tell of your fame, tell of your name, get the story out there. And they used a different Greek word. All the other words are identical to the Septuagint, but they substituted that Greek word out for one that matched the Hebrew. My point is, it's all right. We use our translations most of the time. But sometimes there's something there that could be better. And that's what we're looking for in this study. This, that's what you're trying to grab, is whatever could be better, what you could get more information about. Um, You do have the truth in your English translation of the Bible. It is true. Lots of people have been saved by reading the Bible in translation, not even just the English language, but lots of people have been saved by reading it in translation. And the fact is you don't have to know Greek, but somebody has to know Greek because the apostles didn't speak English. (laughs) And Moses didn't speak English. Somebody has to know it. So, you know, my question would be, why give absolute trust to translation committees made up of denominational people? I mean, yeah, the committee, by and large, means they're going to keep each other in check, and it's basically going to be pretty good. Most translations are basically pretty good. But that doesn't have to be an absolute thing. There's no reason why I can't dig a little bit further. Somebody's got to do this. Can I do better than the scholars who translated it? Yeah, scholarship is a thing you got to take with a grain of salt. But um, can I do better than the scholars? Well, okay, to be fair, the apostles were inspired by God. That's a pretty big advantage. (laughs) So when they deviated from the translation, they, they had it on pretty good authority. Fair enough, and I'm not inspired. I get it. But the committees are not inspired either. You know, don't knock it till you try it. Um, There are those who have parallel English versions, and you can ask them, do you get value out of your parallel English? You know, have you seen these big volumes where you got two or three side by side? That's actually very good. I think David does that, I I noted, because he is a deep thinker, actually. Uh, I say that seriously. Um, But that is... uh, a very good way, and you do find things by comparing those texts to each other. There are differences there sometimes that are quite helpful. For example, if Tom had been reading, or the questioner had been reading the English Standard Version in 1 Peter 3, verse 6, it would have said, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children. because they knew that there was a question about whose daughters when they translated it, and it wasn't clear whether it was the father or the mother. 
So they took the information from the Greek that said it was feminine and provided something in English that still gets that detail across, right? You are her children. They did a good job. But that's, that's just a parallel English version. You can get that same kind of information from those. That's a, that's a good thing to do. That's fine. It, it's, a, it's a good thing to do. But there's other things you can do that are even sharper than that. What can I do? It's all Greek to me. Of course, everybody says, I can't say that anymore. Now I have to say it's all German to me. <laughs> and the Germans, they say it's all Spanish to me, by the way. <laughs> That's kind of fun. <laughs> I don't know any Russians. Okay, you don't need to know any Greek, and you don't need to know any Hebrew to gain the benefit of the original languages. That's the first thing that I'm going to say about this, is this isn't about you're going to learn the alphabet, you're going to learn how to figure out what entry this is in the dictionary. No. Mm -mm. You don't have to do that. You can do a lot of things right now in English from reference works that have already been done. They're, they're very old that you can get. They're easy to find and you can use them and they do most of the work for you, the hard things that have to be done. Um, that's what we're talking about. This is what it takes to unlock those things. Um, now, it's true that beyond this method here, you know, you do need to know more about the language itself. And that is not, um, you know, a short thing. That's not an easy thing. Okay. To be fair about that, this is probably as far as you can get without learning, you know, these languages. Okay. Uh, and learning them will take a lot of time. That's going to take years of study to, to learn them. I'm not discouraging you from doing it, but just saying, don't give up yet, you know. If you're like, well, I got mine, that's good enough, you know. Or I got my parallel English, that's good enough. Don't give up yet. There's one more thing you can do that's really not hard, and that's what we're talking about here, before you get to the years of schooling. <laughs> so don't stop yet. What... Can you unlock? Let me start with examples of what you can unlock. Okay, this is something of a sales pitch, I guess, but I mean, I want to give you examples of what is available to you from the original that you could figure out on your own. You could have done these things because I did them and I'm not smarter than you. What can I unlock? Well, um, you know, the best thing that you can do, and the main reason for doing this is to grab the original word of in the text and find where it comes up or where it is used in some other verses. So you're looking, you know, you're, you're studying some passage, you want to know more about some concept or other, something that this passage says. Well, you... You find that word, you figure out what the original word is, and then you go look at all the other verses that contain this same word. That's, that's it. That's what's happening here. Um, that is already something you can do, and you don't have to know any, any Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic to do it. It doesn't take any foreign language skill at all. You can figure this out right now. So with the same word, but in a different verse, I've broken it into three things for the purposes of my presentation. You may have others. <laughs> but the first is discover how thoughts from the inspired writers may be related. Once you have in front of you the list of the other verses where this word occurs, you can start thinking about well, what are these other verses? What are these other passages? You may find out that the people who wrote this borrowed vocabulary from each other or referred to one another in that same vocabulary, and it may not be obvious in English, because very often our translation into our idiomatic language is going to use a different word in English 
for the same underlying original word in Greek or Hebrew. That does happen. And vice versa. Sometimes two different Greek words or two different, uh, different Hebrew words will be translated with the same English word. So you don't have a way of knowing that there's something different under there, actually. So first thing that happens when you look at the same word in different verses is you find out sometimes that there are related thoughts that you didn't realize were actually related, literally related. Maybe because you're Tom Roberts, you already knew that <laughs> from years of experience. But uh, for the rest of us, you know, it can be helpful to get that little clue. Uh, the other thing that you find is just seeing how it's used in other places, you might get a better definition of the term to understand what what are we talking about here? Like, is there a concrete versus an abstract? And what is the concrete? Because that helps me understand what it means, right? Getting a deeper meaning, a deeper definition without a dictionary, without a lexicon. <laughs> uh, and finally, I think when you're looking at the same word in a different verse and different verses, you can use the context of these different verses to teach you things, to learn things, to uncover things. And uh, we'll talk about that one. So uh, on related thoughts, the example that I will give you is 2 Corinthians 2, um, which is just on the mind. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know why particularly. Maybe some of you do. Um, <laughs> maybe it's because we've been doing a series on that for the last month. <laughs> but whatever it is, 2 Corinthians 2 Verse 11 says, we're not ignorant of his design. 2 Corinthians 11, 3 says, your thoughts will be led astray. When I was doing the lookup on thoughts, and I grabbed the original word there, and I went to look at where else that word occurs, one of the places is the second chapter in the 11th verse. We're not ignorant of his designs. Satan's designs is the same word as our thoughts that may be led astray by Satan. So this is one of the first and the easiest things, you know, the benefit that you get from the original language is that this one, you know, one English word may not correlate to one Greek word. And you may find something like this where it's actually pretty important to understand that and what you'll find is actually one of the interesting things about this particular word is that almost all of the places where it occurs are Second Corinthians. There's one other occurrence. I think it's Philippians. But all of them otherwise are here. And the second chapter is kind of making a crescendo up to the 11th. And that takes, you know, wisdom. That takes teaching. What do you do with that? Well, Paul's trying to get them to accept that they can be tricked because they don't think they can. Because, <laughs> you know, all these lessons about self-righteousness are good for the rest of you, not for me. <laughs> Second Corinthians is doing that. But it's also uh, a different word in the other places where it occurs. It's minds in Second Corinthians 3 and 4 where, where, it, where it happens. So you're beginning to understand there's a, there's a pattern there. These thoughts are related where I wouldn't have immediately put together chapter 2, verse 11 with chapter 11, verse 3. On seeing this and then reading the passages and thinking about them, I realized, ah, indeed, these are related. Ah, this is a string of thoughts. There's a crescendo here. Right? That became clear only because I had the original word. Uh, as for deeper meaning, second example, Matthew 19 and verse 9 talks about divorce, which is a thing that Christians are not supposed to do. Whoever divorces his wife. But this word for divorce was used again in Matthew 27 and verse 15 when Pilate approaches the crowd thinking he's going to be able to set Jesus free, offering Barabbas, you know, trying to lowball the crowd. It says that he was accustomed to release to the crowd a prisoner whom they chose. That word release is the same word 
as the word divorce in Matthew 19, 9. This is what I call deeper meaning, because the familiar word divorce gets clarity. You know, most people are not struggling to understand Matthew 27 as to Pilate releasing a prisoner at a festival. That kind of thing happens. A lot of controversy on Matthew 19 about what is divorce and people doing violence to their marriages. Putting it together with the release of a prisoner is very useful for clarity's sake. It's telling us, you know, when a prisoner is released, that guy is walking away. He's not going back. He doesn't want that anymore. Uh, it used to be that he was required to be there, but now he's, he's, he's not. You can see how that is like divorce, and that is the reason that it's condemned. <laughs> But you get a deeper meaning out of it. And this is, there's no lexicon here, right? There's no dictionary. I didn't tell you what the Greek word is. You don't need to know what it is. You know that this is the same word in both places, and you can noodle on that and think about how is this related and understand the meaning of that and the application of that. It's just one example. Now let's talk about context. My favorite example is ecclesia which everybody knows that word, basically, if you've been in the church for any period of time, you know the word ekklesia is the word for church in Greek. Ekklesia is the word that is translated church. It's actually the word for assembly, but who's counting? Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, there was a great per persecution that arose against the church. Right? That's the common translation of the word ekklesia. If you go to Acts 8, 1, and you look up church, and you go find that word, it's going to be ekklesia, and you're going to find however many hundred references to that word in the New Testament. And there, it's going to, you know, as you're reading down the page, it's going to be church, 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 church. You know, that's what's going to happen until you get to Acts 7, verse 38, where it wasn't translated church. It was translated congregation. Why was it translated congregation in Acts 7.38 when he said Moses was with them in the congregation in the wilderness? Well, because, you know, that's how you translate the Old Testament word. It's congregation, yeah, but it's actually the same Greek word as church. So should he have said Moses was with them in the church in the wilderness? Well, people would say, well, no, because churches aren't Jewish. Right. That's the problem with the English word church. Okay. <laughs> it's actually assembly. It's the assembly or the congregation or the church. But that's the same word. So the congregation of the people of Israel the congregation, you know, everywhere in your Old Testament where you're thinking the congregation of the children of Israel or the assembly of the children of Israel, that is the church. That's the church. That's what we are. We are the spiritual Israel of God today, Galatians 6. We are the congregation in the wilderness. And this wilderness, the world is the wilderness we are in. That's, that's us. It has a lot of ramifications for understanding. By the way, it's also what's in Psalm 22, 22, when he said, I will tell of your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will proclaim your name to my, I will proclaim your name. It's in the midst of the church. In the middle of the church, I will proclaim your name. It's the same word. And you keep skimming down the results, church, 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 church. And then Acts 19 and verse 41 actually it's translated assembly there. What's happening there? Well, that's the riot, the riot in Ephesus. When the people come together in a riot, remember, they're, they're, they're angry about the apostles. They're angry. They, they drag some of the disciples out into the public square and threaten them. They're throwing dirt. They're, some screaming one thing, some screaming another, and nobody knew why they'd come together. Remember, and... and an official comes and breaks it up and says, you know, we, we got to get out of here. We have a lawful assembly for settling disputes in court. But we're in danger of, you know, being called into question for this. 
assembly. And he dismissed the assembly. It's actually church. It's church. Now, this one's harder, right? Because then you're like, well, how is that a church? That's, that's just not related. No, it is related. <laughs> it's absolutely related. Why? It's because the word church means called out, not called out of the world, called out of your house into public to come together. That riot is a church. Those people were called out of their places to come together in a public place. Why? Well, that's different. Some shouted one thing, some shouted another. Nobody knew why they'd come together. Does that describe some churches that we know? Yes. Yes, it does. There's a lot there, isn't it? It's pretty useful to have that. That's what we're getting at. You can leverage the context. You see what happened there. Does that apply? Is that useful? Yes. Yes, it is. That's something that you get understanding from. And I think that's a pretty good, sharp tool. All right, so how do you do it? I'll tell you how you do it. Nuts and bolts, there's actually only like two parts here. Um, concordances is the key. If you don't know what a concordance is, uh, a concordance is a reference work, a book, that lists the words of the Bible one by one, and for every word tells you all the verses where that word occurs. That's all the concordance is. It's all the, Bible, the words of the Bible one by one, and every verse where each word occurs. That's what a concordance is. Uh, they're the best friend that any Bible student has. That, that is true. You need them to search. Any search you're doing, that's a concordance. All right, the first trick is Strong's exhaustive concordance of the Bible. Exhaustive meaning every single word <laughs> of the King James Version. Every single word of the King James Version is in Strong's exhaustive concordance. If you are reading a Bible verse and you have a word there you'd like to know more about, it is in Strong's. You can get a copy of Strong's at Half Price Books, at Amazon, at whatever, um, but you don't need to. They're available online. <laughs> yes, it's also quite heavy. You might need help picking it up. Um, it is exhaustive. But he is the guy who not only made sure that every single word in the King James Bible was accounted for, but also assigned a number to each one of them. They're all uniquely identified by number. That means you have a, 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 an identifying key, a specific number for a specific word. And that is the critical thing. This is the most important thing that anybody can do. Every other tool begins there. Now that we have an index of every single word, now we can key other things to those numbers. Now you don't have to know any Hebrew or Greek. You just grab that number and go to another reference work that is keyed to Strong's numbers. For example, the Englishman's Greek Concordance, which I find to be especially pertinent to those of us, pertinent to those of us who are English speakers and are looking for the Greek of the New Testament. Englishman's Greek concordance is a concordance just like Strong's, except it is not keyed to the King James Bible English words. It is keyed instead to the Greek words of the manuscript of the New Testament. But they're all ordered by Strong's numbers. So you'll get Strong's number, whatever it is, you know, 2,149. And you'll just turn to the page in Englishman's, there in numeric order, that is 2,149. And there you will have, lo and behold, all of the verses that contain that word. Regardless of what they are in English. Sometimes they match, sometimes they don't. That's how we found or that's how I found the other ones, although you can do it by just reading down Strong's, although it's much harder because the word 
you know, the words are translated by multiple Greek and Hebrew words very often. So if you're looking at like love and there's pages and pages of results, it's very hard to scan down that page looking at every number until you find one that's different. That's difficult. It's better to grab a concordance. But that's what you do. Find your verse in the King James Version because that's the version that Strong's indexes. Then you find your King James Version word in Strong's concordance. Strong will give you the number that goes with that word on the entry that corresponds to that verse. And then you'll take that number and go find it in a concordance that accepts strong numbers. Um, you can do this with a King James Bible, a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, and an Englishman's Concordance of the Greek New Testament, which is exactly what I did 30 years ago before cell phones <laughs> and Blue Letter Bible and all that stuff. I remember when you used to have to go to the library to read books to get knowledge, <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's how we used to do it. But of course, today you do have modern technology. You have Blue Letter Bible, for example. And I'm using this one because it's free and easy. It's on the internet. But there's lots of others, actually. There's BibleGateway.com, but I like Blue Letter Bible. Um, there are actually lots of other things available out there. Suit your fancy. But just for an example, I have done some screenshots here, which... I don't know if they're legible, but I'll try to narrate. Um, first thing you do is find the verse you're looking for. Here I'm looking at 2 Corinthians 11 in the King James Version. Although you don't have to use the, a specific version if you're using Blue Letter Bible because they've already figured out for all of them. But just for consistency, I went with King James. You will notice that when I went there, one of the first things on the page is a little checkbox that says Strong's without any explanation, but I just explained it to you. That is the checkbox that means, hey, show me the Strong's numbers. And voila, the numbers magically appear in the text in your Blue Letter Bible app on your phone or in your web browser of choice. All of a sudden, here's my 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, and my mind, from the earlier example, has got a number next to it. Actually, it's a letter and number, G3540. That is the Strong's number for the word underneath minds in 2 Corinthians 11, 3. The Greek word there is G3540. Well, if you click on that thing, it's actually a link, and the link takes you to this, which you may recognize contains a Strong's number. Oh, where is it? Right there, G3540. I am in the right place. Yeah, there's also some scribblies, you know, whatever. Doesn't matter. Just keep scrolling. <laughs> I've got my Strong's number. 3540. It occurs six times in six verses. And notice that first one, 2 Corinthians 2.11, devices. G3540. The second one, 2 Corinthians 3.14, minds. 3540. You see what's happening? I'm getting the list of all the places where it occurred just with a click. Two clicks. And the other thing that's very interesting is, is right here. Blue Letter Bible also links to the Old Testament results in the Septuagint Greek concordance. So if you're that crazy, you can click that link and see everywhere in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that this word occurs. And sometimes... That's very useful. I recommend, if you're, if you're, if you're going to do this, if you're serious, I recommend that you do that, especially in Hebrews um, and in places where it's referring to things in the Old Testament. The tabernacle, the tent of meeting, the uh, 
the uh, holiest of holies, you know, the, these kinds of things, those are good things to follow that link. Because typically they're verbatim quotes from the Old Testament translation. But that's extra. But this is how we discovered that the thoughts of 2 Corinthians 11.3 are the same thing as the schemes of the devil in 2 Corinthians 2.11. That, this is how we did it. I just went to Blue Letter Bible, looked up my verse, you know, clicked the strongs, clicked, you know, pulled up the number on the, the, the word that I wanted, clicked that link and scrolled down, and I got a list of all the other places. There's not many for this one, only six. But that led to, for me anyway, that led to a much better understanding of what was happening there in 2 Corinthians. Without, without reference to the word itself or the meaning of it or a lexicon. There's another way of doing the same thing from the verse. Instead of going to the top of the page and saying, show me all the Strong's numbers, you can also click on the blue, the tools thing there, and it'll open up a parallel uh, right underneath the verse that you're looking at, which is what I did here on 2 Corinthians 11.3. And if you scroll down, it will show you the strong numbers, you know, for every word in the verse. And that is the link. That's a link. It's just like before. When you click it, you go to the results of it. Okay. So there's, an e there's two ways to do the same thing. But that's how it works. And you don't have to know the Greek or read the Greek or, you know, use a lexicon or a dictionary or anything like that. I think those are potentially useful, but, um, well, yeah. Most of the lexicons that are linked and keyed to Strong's numbers are not lexicons that I would use. I'll just say that. I, there, somebody may have uh, indexed Liddell and Scott and Jones, LSJ, Liddell and Scott. Somebody may have indexed that one, and if you can find Liddell and Scott for the Greek, do that. That's absolutely the best in English, but otherwise, uh, take it with a grain of salt. I think you're going to get a better definition by comparing the verses to each other. And it's, it really is a place where you as a Christian, you know God, you know the truth. The people who wrote those lexicons, they did not. They were not Christians. And they get some things wrong. Um or they miss some things. So be careful with that one. I think you get a better understanding by comparing the verses. And you thinking as a genuine child of God about the parallels or the lack thereof in these passages, that's going to help you. And you're going to get a better understanding, I think. All right. In closing, Romans 3, verses 3 and 4 talks about this basic fact that God's word comes through imperfect messengers and it comes through completely unscathed. That's the meaning of Romans 3, verses 3 and 4. Some of those in the Old Testament who were inspired writers sometimes proved to be unfaithful. The prime example here is King David who sinned in the matter of Bathsheba and wrote a psalm about that fact afterward. And that psalm says that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. The exact point that Paul is making is that David did wrong, but God is still right. God's words inspired through David, though he did wrong in his personal life, are still just, and they still prevail. So we've got to believe and understand, and I'm asserting to you, you know, this is not to knock the Scriptures or the reliability of your translation. I don't mean for it to shake your faith at all. I'm saying you can build still more on top of that. You can go deeper. And uh, I dare say you should. Because you're the child of God. You're the one who knows the scriptures. You're the one who knows the truth. These treasures are for you. They're 
you know, God is speaking to you. You're the one who can put these things together reliably and usefully. Well, today, perhaps there is somebody who is not a Christian who is among us. Let us help you to obey the gospel before it's too late. God's always right, though we are imperfect in getting across his word. You can get a Bible, you can read it for yourself and understand what God wants you to do. To obey the gospel is to repent of sins, believing that Jesus is the Son of God and that he's resurrected from the dead, never to die again, and to be buried in baptism for forgiveness of sins. We have water prepared to help you do this. If you've done these things already and are a Christian but need the prayers of the saints, we will pray with you that you might be restored to God if there's sin in your life. And let's help each other on in the study of God's word. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.